Um, enjoy this video. Um, it's the beginnings of some um, research that we're doing within the, the current iteration, but it's something that Jay has been looking into for the last four years. So enjoy, we'll stick around for the Q&A. Um, audiability is about 40%, so if you can tr transcribe the questions, we'll be able to contribute in that way. So in this talk, which is titled Crypto Economics towards Mass Behavioral Engineering or a Network Commons, um, I wanted to approach the question of crypto economics from uh, two very different angles. So um, one is looking at uh, crypto economics a little bit more practically. Um, through a project that myself and Dan Hassan um, are developing called Cobox, and we're developing that project as part of a collective called the Magma Collective, um, which also comprises Mu Devarian, Peg, and Kieran Gibb. Um, and on behalf of all of us, um, yeah, it's a shame that we can't be there in person to, to meet you face to face and have these conversations. Um, but both myself and Dan Hassan will be. Um, in a live Q&A just after this video, so um, yeah, stick around. Um, and so one approach to crypto economics more kind of practically, and I would also like to discuss it a little bit more theoretically, which is drawing on work that I've done in a PhD that I completed about six months ago. Um, that PhD was a kind of political analysis of major blockchain protocols. Um, and that's where I first started to look at the full political spectrum of uh, people and projects that are kind of involved in forming this new discipline of crypto economics. Um, so I thought I would describe a little bit the kind of uh, the history of crypto economics as a discipline um, and some of the political stakes at play there and some of the kind of political ideas that are being kind of worked on there. Um, because partially I want to explore um, whether there is the possibility of opening up a kind of um, more interesting radical political space in the field um, and the reasons of which I will discuss uh, shortly. So the overview of the talk is um, I thought I would give a little bit of an introduction to, to crypto economics initially and then after that, um, describe some of the kind of questions that we're um, mulling around in Cobox um, on this topic of crypto economics, um, and then basically open it up for discussion after. Crypto economics as a like new form of discipline that's emerging is usually traced back to Bitcoin. And some of the easiest ways of describing what crypto economics means really is looking at the Bitcoin mining system. Um, where miners in the Bitcoin network uh, contribute to the network by um, mining, which serves the purpose of verifying transactions in the network. So it's kind of essential for the functioning of, of that particular type of um, protocol design. Um, and they're then rewarded for that work of transaction verification through the creation of new Bitcoin. Um, and the, the kind of fundamental idea is to create a kind of internal economic system uh, such that um, behavior that contributes to the functioning and the running of the network is also rewarded within that network. Um, while at the same time making bad behavior or attacks very expensive. Uh, some of these ideas predate Bitcoin somewhat, somewhat. so the kind of proof of work uh, uh, protocol that uh, is used in Bitcoin um, comes from a set of ideas that was initially uh, developed to combat spam. Um, and the idea was like, okay, if we make, if we put a price on sending emails, then if you send lots and lots of emails, then it can start to get very expensive. And the idea was to set up like different forms of price mechanisms um, to make spam very expensive while making um, emails that are not spam uh, kind of relatively trivial in terms of, of price. Um, and so what we can see is like the kind of basics of crypto economics is like from a kind of systems engineering perspective, usually rather than drawing on particularly sophisticated economic ideas, that's changing somewhat and economists are getting more involved. Uh, people coming from a kind of monetary and, and complementary currency background are, are getting slightly more involved. Um, but really it's, it's the use of uh, economic dynamics in a network to achieve certain kind of network secur security and, and behavioral effects. Um, that's the kind of fundamentals. And, and the, on a very basic level, the idea is to um, economically incentivize certain behaviors that are considered good while economically disincentivizing certain, econom certain behaviors that are considered to be bad for the network. Um, 
But so uh, I would argue, you know, there, there's a kind of certain approach to, to those dynamics that I would argue becomes like more ideological um, in Bitcoin and especially also with the introduction of Ethereum, where some of these concepts move from being like, let's say, a bit more like uh, kind of limited to a kind of systems design approach to expand it as a kind of bit of a political um, ideology and a kind of general outlook on the world. Um, so like a lot of the work that I've done in my PhD traces how that happened um, with the, uh, the introduction of Ethereum as really a kind of second generation um, uh, cryptographic system, or crypto economic system, blockchain system. So with Ethereum, the, the focus really shifted from developing um, or from a uh, um, uh, kind of like a cryptocurrency development to a kind of blockchain as such and a kind of generalized platform. And I would say that kind of generalization also kind of generalized the kind of understanding of what this type of system can do um, uh, from like, uh, let's say, a certain kind of network architecture to a kind of broader outlook with the ideas that like, oh, this is going to disrupt everything from legal systems to political systems and and institutions as we know it. Um, the basic kind of model for that, the basic ingredients of that ideology, let's say, um, is the idea that decentralized networks will replace authorities, um, that uh, cryptography will secure those networks, and that um, uh, economic incentives will ensure that um, that network operates on the basis of what is considered good behavior. So incentives will, will also contribute to the behavior of the network. Um, and so there's a certain kind of, you know, I think for a lot of us, there's like some interesting elements to that, you know, okay, decentralized networks replacing authorities and so on. But it's also important to understand the difference between decentralized networks as they're kind of um, developed in terms of technical systems versus as they're developed as like um, social forms of uh, social and political forms of organizing. And there is a strong tendency in the blockchain world um, towards uh, technological determinism um, and some pretty kind of um, uh, extreme kind of uh, right wing and, and libertarian tendencies um, with the idea that really, you know, um, code and networks and cryptography can replace a lot of uh, kind of human fallibility. So instead of having, for example, instead of having a legal system um, uh, that, uh, you know, a, a kind of, or let's say a, a political and a legal system that determines kind of laws and that then enforces those, those laws and so on, that you'd have a kind of, you know, code that simply just executes exactly as it's written. Um, and so therefore, you know, we can kind of get rid of, of, of legal systems and so on. Um, and we've solved the governance problem by, by ensuring that the network is decentralized and, and no one has kind of um, uh, power over the network, let's say. A lot of those things are assumptions, a lot of those things are heavily ideological, um, and a lot of them don't hold up to be true um, once they're uh, actually, you know, in, in actual implementation. And of course, anyone that comes from a background looking at um, questions of power and, and politics, there is, you know, the main question that comes up is like, well, if if protocols are supposed to replace a lot of um, uh, uh, political and legal systems as we know them, um, who gets to write those protocols and how are those protocols governed um, and what ideas go into their design. And a lot of this, like which ideas go into their design is, is something that is, you know, needs to be traced pretty carefully. Um, there's a lot of like assumptions, um, economic assumptions and social assumptions um, that goes into the design of these systems um, that really are based on a kind of, yeah, pretty basic um, uh, right-wing economic thinking. Um, but that's a whole other talk in itself. Um, what I also wanted to get to here was um, that actually there was a breadth of people that were in, uh, interested in Bitcoin as a project, um, a breadth of people for, in terms of political backgrounds and reasons for why they found the protocol to be so interesting. I guess what I want to highlight is there are many different approaches to crypto economics. There are many different reasons for why people find crypto economics to be an interesting or important new field. Um, one of which is uh, basically, you know, there was a kind of, there's been a kind of experience of open source projects and peer-to-peer -peer networks 
um, as being, you know, it, uh, like in the long term, uh, you know, it's, it's work to run these networks, it's work to keep these code bases alive. Um, and, you know, kind of burnout um, and uh, lack of long term sustainability of these projects meant that when uh, the idea of, you know, a kind of internal economy or an internal kind of token system came about, um, people became quite excited about that. It was, you know, here was a possibility for somehow creating some some type of economic sustainability for networks in the long and so there is, you know, this this other approach to the economic ideas, this other approach to the the kind of field of crypto economics that isn't about uh, behavioral engineering, that isn't about the kind of wholesale replacement of um, uh, social and political forms of organizing, but is uh, understood more as kind of supporting um, decentralized forms of social and political organizing. Um, through by making uh, networks um, economically sustainable um, and somewhat autonomous from uh, from you know governments and the private sector and corporations. So really, on the kind of more interesting end of the political spectrum, or to also place crypto economics in the context of um, the internet today, uh, crypto economics can be seen as a as a kind of economic or business model um, answer to the way the internet. Um, operates economically today, which is very much based on surveillance, um, advertising, and kind of security targeting or intelligence gathering, let's say. Um, and so the idea is that if current day business models or current day internet business models are based on kind of data extractivism, um, if we're going to try and make that impossible by creating a more privacy aware internet, then what are the forms of new types of business models that can sustain that kind of network? Um, so crypto economics, in a sense, like on the one hand, the idea is like, well, instead of thinking things through as like normal kind of uh, business cases, um, let's think them through as a kind of more as a network. And so on the one side, you have people that try that see crypto economics as the creation of or the formation of new forms of markets that will sustain um, uh, new internet pri privacy aware internet infrastructures. On the other hand, people, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, people are looking at it more as a kind of commons. So how can we kind of address internet infrastructures um, and design internet infrastructures in a privacy aware manner where the kind of um, economic thinking that sustains it draws more from a kind of commons perspective instead. And so, you know, these, all these kinds of things are, are in play. But to get to kind of like slightly more gnarly side of the argument, um, there is the problem that like obviously... Uh, to create a token is very different than creating an economy. And we see this also in, in, in Bitcoin. So, you know, there is this idea, okay, Bitcoin creates like, you know, new kind of economic autonomy and so on and so forth. But actually like at every step of the moment, the Bitcoin, um, uh, the value of a Bitcoin um, is completely and absolutely dependent on its interface with, uh, with other economies. Um, the difference between a token simply and, and an economy is like a token is just a it's it's a symbol for something it represents something um, but for that token to actually be representing an entire economy you need uh, the full kind of cycle of production and reproduction um, happening within the kind of an ecosystem that uses that token and so that's absolutely not the case for Bitcoin it's not the case for for any cryptocurrency at this point so what I'm saying is that it's not Bitcoin per se that creates value but it's interfaces with other economies where value is produced um, and then exchanged for the Bitcoin token. Um, and so what really matters, but what is often sidelined, is that it's it's the interface and the nature of that interface between a kind of given token system and other eco economies that really matters and that really determines the power of that token, that really determines um, how it operates. Um, and in the Bitcoin case, you know, it's the interface with uh, exchange rates. Um, those exchange rates, you know, are... Uh, they depend on all forms of kind of market manipulation, exchange rate manipulation, and um, basically like good graphics, scams, and whatever else. And that's the work that goes into uh, enabling or empowering the kind of Bitcoin infrastructure by, you know, bringing attention to it and bringing new investment to it. Um, that investment takes the form of, of fiat currencies. Those fiat currencies interface with the entire kind of economies in which production and reproduction takes place. Um, and so Bitcoin holders have access to those different forms of economies. It doesn't actually um, entail a kind of economic space in its own right. Um, 
this has simply not happened yet. And that's important to keep an eye on because it says a lot about what kind of work needs to go into the project of creating kind of new forms of economic autonomy. And so I would like to suggest that um, to, to look at disciplines that really are kind of experts in this field of analyzing um, areas of productive and reproductive economic activity, let's say, that has been made invisible or that tends to be sidelined. Um, and so, you know, feminist political economy is really an area that I think we can draw from a lot to try and understand some of the dynamics in the space. Um, for several different reasons. Uh, first of all, it's it's a discipline that's very well versed at looking at um, exactly these processes of, of uh, work and activity that's being made invisible. So to acknowledge the fact that we don't have, um, you know, a kind of hermetically sealed uh, economic bubble that we can just fully model and then make it kind of function in some kind of like holistic uh, circular way. But that actually the way that economies function is that they feed off of each other in lots of different ways. And so like, you know, the, the productive economy feeds off, off of the reproductive economy, private sector feeds off of public sector, plus the invisible kind of reproductive spaces. And so it's really understanding the interrelationship between these different economic modes that um, that is uh, very important and to understand that these economic modes operate very differently. So where you might have a kind of private sector that um, where kind of profit generation is more, more important then you know you will have a public sector that interfaces with that and enables that and makes that possible um, partially by establishing kind of re, um, let's say redistributive functions. Um, and I have, plenty, I have some anecdotes on that, but I'm not going to go into it. Um, but so th my question here is if we have ways of understanding these diverse economic spaces, let's say, um, and to kind of begin the work of drawing out the economic spaces that tend to not be represented in these models, um, we can also start to describe a little bit what are the um, what are the economic functions that, that they have that are unique. You know, if we understand the private kind of sphere is generally focused on, on profit making, public sphere is generally focusing on, on redistributed functions um, and creating a kind of base layer for societies to operate on. Um, what do we understand like kind of commons based economy to, to function as? How does it sit in relation to these other spheres? How can we strengthen it in relation to these other spheres? Um, and how does that map onto the specific dynamics that are at play in, in network technologies? And does crypto economics actually represent a new form of economic sphere, a new form of economic space that runs on, on a, a different set of logics? Um, the second reason why I think feminist political economy is a kind of interesting approach is um, that it's very, it's a kind of discipline that's very good at also, I say both feminist and post-colonial um, studies, is very good at kind of looking at how these forms of relationships to different spaces um, uh, are kind of created historically. So, you know, what are the processes through which certain kinds of resources and certain kinds of humans are made uh, into things that can be extracted or things that can be exploited um, and look at kind of all the social processes around that. And I think that's also very relevant because we're looking at relationships between different economic modes and we're looking at the qualities of those relationships. So are those relationships extractive? Are they mutual? Are they collaborative? Are they additive? Um, and how can we engage with that in a strategic way when we're trying to create uh, decentralized network technologies that um, will have some form of uh, economic sustainability and some form of economic autonomy also? So to wrap up and bring it back down to something a bit more practical um, and bring it back to the Cobox project, um, Cobox is um, uh, something that we're building in the Magma Collective um, and we're building it on the DAT stack. Uh, the basic idea is to create a kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer infrastructure that allows for cooperatives and small groups that don't have a lot of in-house technical capacity to share the kind of load of backing up um, each other's files and that the system would eventually feed into um, a kind of uh, broader um, infrastructural uh, stack to enable what we are, are calling a cooperative cloud. So instead of um, defaulting onto kind of corporate infrastructures because of convenience and because it, they co it costs less and, and so on, to create something that is um, economically, practically, and on a usability level, um, very easy for small groups to use, um, 
and that will also allow them to set various trust settings uh, so that they can share their the, the backup load but also share files with groups and organizations that they trust um, in a kind of easy way. Um, so yeah, Cobox, uh, the idea is to enable a peer-to-peer -peer cooperative cloud. Um, and uh, what I wanted to discuss today, what I wanted to put on the table today is the question of whether such an infrastructure or what to what extent such an infrastructure um, needs to interface with some of these crypto economic ideas. Um, the kind of assumption or the, the hypothesis in uh, some of the more interesting people working on crypto economics um, is that uh, the approach is necessary when dealing with large decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks um, because it allows for some kind of economic sustainability of the network. Um, and so, you know, my question really is, um, is tokens and token design the best way to go about doing that? Um, can we think about um, the economic autonomy and sustainability of decentralized networks, not as a kind of hermetic bubble outside of um, other modes of production, but sitting in and amongst other modes of production um, and reproduction? And whether kind of modeling that space um, will enable us to kind of come up with, with new and interesting economic models that might draw a little bit on crypto economics that might, um, yes, have a kind of internal accounting system for how different nodes are contributing to the network and yes, try and remunerate those nodes in some kind of a way, but also to understand the way that that network will always um, and already be interfacing with um, other forms of, of economic production and reproduction and how we can really empower that and how we can kind of um, draw in value to to peer-to-peer -to -peer and open source projects um, with an economic analysis that looks more at the interfaces with, with existing economic spheres. Um, I hope that doesn't get too abstract. I hope that's kind of a useful and interesting um, topic for discussion more generally. Um, and I really do uh, think that this is some of the kind of more interesting, like really interesting questions to put on the table at the moment um, and really think about how can we move forward with the development of peer-to-peer -peer technologies and open source projects in a way that avoids burnout, in a way that avoids kind of depletion of resources um, and that can be a bit more kind of sustainable um, going forward. So yes, I look forward to discussing more with all of you in a minute. So, um, hello. <laughs> what happens when a non-cooperative wants to use this stuff? Do you just say like, no, go away? Or do you just let them do whatever? I, I can take a stab at that. Um, so in, in the first instance, given that co-ops is the realm from which we're embedded, it just allows um, easier prototyping with uh, committed participants. Co-ops are just a subset of wider organizations. Um, so the concept is that along the way, people who aren't co-ops will pick it up, use it within their context in their realms. There's gonna be nothing in the technology which enforces the type of organization you, you are um, so I guess uh, another way of looking at that question is, um, I wonder if you're asking, um, will businesses without cooperative values be able to leverage and use the, the underlying technology or, or way of working? I guess our thesis is yes, but time will tell. Um, I don't know if I've captured the heart of your question though. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yep. So kind of a two-part question. The first one, is there like a toolkit within Cobox to like look at how to engineer tokens while you use it or is it just like a set flow? Waiting for a transcription on that one. The audio wasn't too good. Oh, sorry. Uh, is there kind of like a baked in token economic system to it? Or is it like building blocks by which you would 
build a token economy in there or just for Cobox? Jay, do you want to grab that one? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Is my, yeah, great. Um, is there a token economic system built into it? Right, so um, uh, we have not decided whether we can have an internal token as part of the Cobox system or not. But I do think that um, token economics as a kind of possibility um, opens up a lot of questions. Well, crypto economics as a possibility opens up a lot of questions around how we want to handle the economics um, more generally. And I guess part of what I was trying to explain in the talk was that there's lots of different angles you can do that from um, by understanding a little bit about uh, or trying to map a little bit the kind of economic spaces that the box will kind of interact with um, as a device. And so, you know, it's, I guess, like partially, and, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit sad that we're not in Toronto because I think it's an interesting discussion to have. Um, this question of whether something like Cobox does need a, a to an internal token or not. Um, and I'm thinking more specifically on kind of situations where, for example, um, if you have, you know, a radical archive that has lots and lots of images and, and kind of uh, footage and whatever else of um, uh, various things which are kind of like heavy files, um, uh, and they're having that backed up elsewhere, um, is there the need for, or under what conditions would there be the need for some form of kind of, if not like token and remuneration system, at least something that's a kind of like accounting system that has some overview of where kind of the, the, the cost of um, storage and the cost of kind of um, upkeep of, of um, different backup systems falls. Um, so that there can be some kind of like uh, cooperation on those economic costs. So it's, let's say, it's an area that we are interested in, in Cobox, and it's an area that we're trying to kind of work out, but we're trying to do it kind of very delicately, not kind of jumping straight for a token. Um, we don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about things in all conditions. Um, and it's, you know, the kind of intermediation of kind of token systems um, changes the nature of, of relationships, and a lot of those need to be sensitive to the kinds of networks that the box uh, sits within already. So, you know, if you're in a network of trusted organizations that um, have a kind of principle and set of ethics around sharing resources, um, that's fine. And then maybe you'd want to have more of a kind of like accounting system just to understand how to kind of make sure that solidarity is kind of taken care of or cooperation is taken care of in a way that kind of makes sense. Um, but if you're in a kind of network of, let's say, you know, trustless nodes in a sense, then maybe there is, uh, it does make sense to have some kind of like token or, or some other kind of arrangement. So these are, these are questions that are open questions for us. Um, and really this talk is kind of a first stab of bringing together um, the practical project of, of Cobox and, and some of the kind of uh, research in crypto economics. Cool, thank this you. This talk is meant as an open question, let's say. I'll append on to that um, just a, a really one way I have of thinking of it is that there are historical tendencies that we can look to which don't have token economics, um, which show that um, the capacity to raise consciousness and make things happen um, without it do exist. An example of which is the long traditions of cooperatives. Um, so if you in particular look at um, the history of cooperatives in America amongst the African-American community um, who used those um, te organizing technologies without a lot of um, resources to begin with because of slavery, um, banks, uh, insurance companies, um, mutual aid funds, that type of thing, because the existing racist systems simply would not serve them. Um, that's just one example of uh, how you can dig yourself out of a hole without tokens necessarily. Um, yes, yeah, so I just want to add that in as um, in agreement to Jay. We're not convinced you absolutely need it um, in all cases. Um, but then on, on the flip side, 
given that we're dealing with public private key cryptography, all peers in the system do have the underlying upon which you could build tokens. So it's, we're also not building it in a way which excludes that possibility in the future. You, uh... It's uh, and sorry, just to add to that a little bit more. Sorry, uh, is it's really it's the question of how you know what how do you make kind of efforts and resources that are going into things? How do you make that visible? And tokens is kind of one way to do that, but um, it's a very sensitive question of whether it's the best way to do that. Um, sometimes these forms of abstractions create kind of new types of weird relationships um, that can be kind of more alienating or than anything. Other times they can do the opposite. So it's really kind of to think sensitively about um, how kind of visibility uh, uh, is, is kind of created around um, work and resources that's put into maintaining networks. Cool. I think that segues into kind of like a second part to my question around yeah, making visible invisible labor, right? So perhaps, say you have some token economy and there is a form or category of labor that's not captured, right? Uh, I guess in perhaps like uh, shitstorm cryptocurrency land, sometimes that just results in like a fork, right? And like a whole community moves or whatever. But if, uh, if there is a system that can like absorb or, or make visible the invisible, that suggests like the system is kind of self-patching or like taking feedback from the community, right? Now, do you think that there could be forms of labor that are incommensurate or like just not able to be made visible or just are not compatible with like a token economic system? Sorry, if that's rambling, I can try to clarify. Ben, did you get that? Maybe just the last part. I can answer the question that I think I heard. Do you think there are forms of labor that cannot be captured by token economics? That's probably the simplest. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. What are they? Um, um, Jay, Jay's more um, in, in the reads, but I'll just give one uh, that I noticed in Twitter land is um, even projects which have thoughts, let's put aside what you think of the specific project. Um, I'm not meaning to kind of um, do a value judgment at all, but with uh, Zcash, they've got a pretty robust um, notion of how, is it Zcash with Zico? Yeah, um, of how uh, in their system uh, development is uh, going to be funded internal to that ecosystem. And if you look at actual contributions, so uh, the TLDR of that is um, some amount of the um, uh, funds go to an internal foundation, which can then be, um, which can then be uh, put towards development, governance, that type of thing. Um, now, in reality, if you look at then who's actually contributing, who's outside the foundation, oftentimes people who are contributing code or whatever, but don't have access to that internal governance. Um, in particular, I've noticed folks who are um, kind of gender diverse, trans, uh, neurodiverse, are often told, um, if, if you want to contribute, do, but we're not obliged to pay you. Um, now that's that's with uh, labor where it's um, it's it should be visible within that system. That's code. It's commits. It's git like git commits. It's blah. And even that is not being valued. So then, of course, when you get into the realm of um, emotions uh, like mutual support and all of that, if we can't even capture the stuff that's easy to capture, there's bound to be stuff which you can't which isn't. Um, Jay, what do you think? Um, I just think that it points to really the contradiction between or the, 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 the fallacy in assuming that um, a wage or a kind of um, 
quantification of labor uh, is kind of somehow rational in any kind of sphere. I mean, it's, it is to some extent arbitrary in a kind of like historical settlement, um, you know, that is also hugely gendered and, and racialized and whatever else. Um, so like, I, like there's, there's never any kind of like rational pricing of things like labor or resources. Um, it's a bit of a kind of abstraction from the beginning, but it does, but there are, things that can kind of help um, because we do live within economies where we do have to pay for things like electricity and new hard drives and whatever else. Um, so some type of visibility around uh, what efforts are going into things um, might make sense. Uh, but there's also, I think like a lot of the questions or a lot of the interesting stuff around token economics, a lot of the very delicate stuff for me is working out, um, uh, I guess to some extent, the um, like how fine grained you want to go. So exactly because we know that like the pricing is never actually um, accurate for the amount of like work, um, the amount of kind of resources or whatever else that, that goes into any given uh, person's kind of efforts in the space or any given kind of raw material. Um, given that we know that, um, like I would argue for kind of more spaciousness rather than more fine-grained um, aspects of, of pricing. So instead of like going for, um, I, I'm not sure, I might be kind of rambling a little bit here because it's a bit late <laughs> in my end of the world. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is like, you know, you can try and say like, oh, let's count, you know, every second that someone spends with their child in order to remunerate for childcare that would be one way to go about doing it, which would then necessitate some kind of weird total surveillance that includes kind of um, checking your emotional state and your attention span and all this kind of stuff, which is like, you know, uh, pretty insane. But that would be the kind of fine grained micro way of trying to measure um, and take into account every bit of effort that goes in, in that direction. The other way is to give it more space and, uh, and allow for more, kind of more trust, which means, you know, going the direction of something like universal basic income, this type of stuff where it's like, well, we trust that you're doing things that are useful. So therefore, here are a bunch of resources to just do a bunch of things that, we, that we're assuming are gonna be useful. Um, so it's, a, I guess, like an, an argument for a bit of spaciousness in terms of kind of like, uh, at least quantification um, when it comes to trying to uh, use uh, tokens in, as a way to um, uh, make visible uh, labor and effort and resources that go into things. Uh, do we have another, maybe time for one more question, if there is one? But I'm not seeing any hands, so maybe we'll say thank you so much, Dan and Jaya, for joining us. Um, if it is evening in your time zone, have a good night. <laughs> Have a great day, guys. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thanks. And uh, thank you.